This is Valley Podcast. I was being paid to do whatever I wanted to if I had time. When you're a freelance independent contractor, you set the clock schedule for when you're going to be there and what you're going to do. And it, I could visit anybody anywhere on the Atari campuses. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Stan Osborne was a freelance software engineer in Atari's design research department from 1981 through 1984. He also worked on projects for the coin-op and home computing departments. He created microkernels, proof-of-concepts, proto-applications, and device drivers. There are two versions of this interview. The podcast version is about an hour shorter. The extended version is at the Internet Archive and includes a lot more of Stan's education, jobs, and history before he was at Atari. This interview took place on March 16, 2017, with a short additional segment added on August 4th. Okay, so design research was a department funded by Nolan Bushnell for people who had worked close to him while he was preparing to skedaddle and sell out out to Warner. Meaning the budgets were all set up before Warner got there to interfere with him. And we got our building. I was part of the team that moved in as soon as it was ready and it wasn't really completely ready. And we were interviewing and hiring more people to work there. And Sherman Kennedy was first hired by uh, uh, Harry Jenkins. And then I was hired uh, as a contract because I wouldn't work any other way. I was teaching part-time and I said, look, this is what I do. I work part-time and I, I teach part-time. And, at that time, I was still going to graduate classes, and so I said, I'm also a part-time graduate student working on a Master's of Science in Computer Science. So, um, I was brought in to do things right away, while before we had moved in, so I did some real crazy stuff out of the temporary location, so I never even had a desk at that time. I'd just come in and work somewhere. Uh, and Sherman moved, and Harry Jenkins moved, and and so, uh, the, some of the administrative staff that he brought from Nolan's office moved. But I didn't know his his Harry Jenkins' history with Atari. No one had a little uh, Wikipedia that said this is what Harry Jenkins has done for us so far. Right. That he had all these patents and other things. His name was on patents from yeah. some pretty crazy stuff and I was shocked when I saw that just doing research for this talk Um, but uh, as part of um, this Sherman had recruited people he worked for at Digital and it turns out that they were of, of three brothers called the McKay brothers and the oldest brother had worked from being a an apprentice engineer to being actually treated as an engineer capable of uh, self-managing uh, very important projects inside digital development environment. But he was an engineer in um, corporate research and development and he worked directly for the, the scientists in charge of the signal integrity laboratory and and how to be a signal integrity engineer had been drummed into him by his boss so eventually he was the signal integrity uh, quality assurance person for new products and that required so much testing that he had access to the corporate helicopter and he flew all over New England to all their different factories where he needed specific equipment for testing a new product and then he would go in there in the evening and work through the night and then the helicopter would pick him up and take him home and he'd sleep during the day things like that were going on but anyway the McKay brothers came more or less as a as a package 
you want one of us, you got to hire all three of us. And they had a collection that was bigger than Sherman Kennedy's. And uh, because all three of them were hired by Atari, Atari moved them in at least one 18-wheeler moving van, perhaps two, uh, from where they were in uh, the Maynard, Massachusetts Beltway area to um, Santa Clara, uh, Cupertino. They found a big house in Cupertino that they could afford together with a lot of bedrooms and a backyard swimming pool. And they all moved in and we had a lot of interesting parties there. But um, so that was crazy. Um, let's see. John McKay had been the vacuum pump technician on Digital's high-end LSI chip fabrication facility, so he knew everything there was to know about vacuum pumps and and chip fabrication. Cool. And the the young the um, middle brother, I believe the middle brother was named uh, Robert McKay, sometimes uh, always nicknamed as Birdie, uh, Robert, I guess, or something, but they, he was nicknamed as Birdie McKay. And um, uh, uh, Birdie had the, basically had been trained by his two brothers, so he was learning how to be a, a technician uh, and he was responsible for our lab flat slash stock room and we made sure everything you ever needed was always there you didn't have to ask or wait for something it, you know oh, I'm going to be working with this stuff oh well, let me call the salesman because we were Atari and the biggest employer in the valley at the time the salespeople lathered us in free samples and you name it, but anyway, so it turned out a couple of us graduate students were the software guys, and Sherman and the McKay brothers were the hardware guys, and so I started uh, writing an operating system kernel for the Atari 400-800 as uh, something we agreed was necessary for all of our projects. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I'd already had the, you know, I didn't, I don't know if I actually took the source code, but I had listings and, and I had a copy of the source code from the other place, which I probably shouldn't have, but I wrote it over again and got it to compile and run. But it, instead of uh, using, writing device drivers from scratch, I basically made wrappers for the Atari ROM BIOS stuff that was in the 400 and the 800. And, except for, you know, when there really wasn't anything and it was always done with uh, the program's code. And I designed some frame buffer management technology that allowed me to have really smooth transitions from uh, one graphics display links to the next to the point where I got uh, people who've been asking people to make user interface applications say uh, yours is the smoothest I've ever seen how did you do it and then I'd start talking about you know software design and I'd lose them because they all they knew is their user interface experience they didn't know how software was built most of the people there and I was teaching um, Sherman Kennedy and uh, Michael McKay how to program because they wanted to know more and more about firmware and how to make it. And <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, I was being paid to do whatever I wanted to if I had time. When you're a freelance independent contractor, you set the clock schedule for when you're going to be there and what you're going to do. And it, I had free reign of anybody's I could visit anybody anywhere on the Atari campuses if 
they invited me because I couldn't necessarily get into their building without a, without a name drop. Like so and so said, I should stop by. And design research was under the umbrella of corporate research and development, but I didn't understand Harry Jenkins' role in the history. And so the R&D building was much bigger and was down the street. And that's where there was a whole section where they were designing new chips. And Alan Kay had an office upstairs and uh, a lot of uh, MIT, uh, should I say, M MIT AI lab um, experienced people had uh, research offices and uh, there was all kinds of stuff for people of different levels of experience in the R&D um, scientific research community of computers. Cool. So let's yeah. talk about some of your, your projects. You mentioned the, the microkernel <laughs> thing. That sounds interesting. And you said you created ROMs for Sound Tunnel at Great America. I don't know what that is. I couldn't even research that. So, Well, uh, yeah, it, it was a... <clears throat> um, Atari Marketing uh, and Harry Jenkins and Sherman Kennedy convinced Great America that we could build an interactive, uh, uh, touch-sensitive, uh, you know, tactile domish like and that's uh, referring to something of the exploratorium, uh, place that had lights and sound and no visible moving parts. So we were using electrostatic uh, uh, detection technology, but all of these sounds were made by Atari 400s, and all of these um, sensors were detected by Atari 400s. So, and Sherman kind of designed where all the speakers were because that's something he loved. Was before he went from. Uh, Basically, Detroit. He he worked in a Chicago uh, top Chicago nightclubs as a sound engineer, and then he went to uh, Ohio. And, and then Ohio, he drove to Chicago to work in his jobs, and, and then he took all that knowledge with him to digital when he went east. And so he loved building outrageous sounding stuff. And he's the one who figured out that he could get the touch-sensitive aluminum panels to be detected by, uh, to function by hand-touching them using the controller ports of an Atari 400. So he had all proof of concept on the bench, and then we built this tunnel, which was apparently very, very popular and stayed longer than the initial commitment. and. Sherman was the only person who'd go out there and do the tech support on it if something failed. Because he'd, you know, he'd done digital tech support for massive 16-bit computer systems. And uh, anyway. So this thing ran on, on Atari 800, this sound tunnel? Yeah, the sound tunnel ran on 800, 400 800s, and I, I put all the code in... in game ROMs and just stuck them in the, in the ROM port and it, and I made you know I made a library of sounds and then I made a like a random number generator that would select what it played when you touch it so it was never quite the same sure it was very uh, but it ran on my operating system so all I did was write an application for things I'd already for all the device drivers I already had working, like make it make play these sounds, make it change this animation. But most of these didn't have anything connected to a video port. Sure. They were just flipping lights and flashing. There was no LEDs, so So it was the Atari controlling the video through the joystick or something or some sort of serial or no, was no, that no, separate? No, they were, they were, these things were locked up in the back of of the tunnel. Sure. In the walls. And, yeah. and you couldn't mess with them. They were designed like any uh, arcade where you can't literally modify how they behave. Sure. And you couldn't pull them apart. You couldn't disconnect any cables. Sure. 
So there's no chance in the world that these ROMs still exist somewhere, is there? Sherman might have a collection. I don't know. Hmm. Um, I haven't seen or talked with Sherman in a long time. Uh, that's a whole other um, story about how <clears throat> health issues make friendship kind of harder to maintain. Yeah, he, he has similar health issues that I do, and we're pretty much the same age. And I mean, with the internet, I can figure out where he is. I think, but I haven't approached him. Yet, so. Yeah. Uh, it says you uh, worked with uh, the laserdisc based point of sale kiosk based on the, the Atari I'm guessing that's the Eric kiosk I can't remember the the, the code name for it uh, basically we built a prototype we were pl- Sherman it was playing around with laser disc uh, stuff and I guess the Atari made a product that you could put a laser disc on a 400 800 and he's, and because J- Harry Jenkins had been working with marketing pretty much since the beginning of his days at Atari when they were all in the same building um, <clears throat> we built a prototype using standard Atari software so you just had to write a little basic program to control the whole thing and um, sourced all the parts so that we could propose that they build a, build a few of them. And we were using uh, Sony Profil monitors, which were just in those days state-of-the-art brand new video monitors that didn't have any electronics for tuning. You had to get a separate tuner. Later, they made a TV based on the profile, but they were selling those to TV stations as as video monitors. And um, we made a prototype, and by that point in time, we were hired. We had a a guy working with us who worked also for Coinop, and he'd been at Coinop a long time, and he'd run the fab line at Coinop, so he could make kiosks. And he helped us design a really, really uh, Atari coin-op style kiosk. And we um, pitched it apparently at the right moment in time for a Christmas frenzy. And maybe we took it to uh, CES, and so it was working at CES. And so marketing said, we want to put these... In all the stores that need help selling Atari 400 and 800 and Laserdisc. You know, so all the stuff that went with those boxes was going to be promoted with the kiosk. And we said, uh, we asked uh, how many did they want? And they came back like immediately, we want 3,000. And so we said, we can't make those here, but but Coinop can make them. And so our, our manufacturing uh, production line uh, manager, supervisor, said, I'll, I'll work with Coinop to get these made. And then we called Sony. Can you deliver 3,000 of these units? And Sony salesperson jaw hit the floor because they were costing around $1,000 each. Mm-hmm. We just ordered 3 million of them. Three million dollars worth of it, and he loved us after that. Every prototype that he had from Sony that he could show to people was handed wow. to us after that, and we so, made his we made him a rich. Wow. He was getting paid a commission. Wow! But three thousand of these were not made. Yes, they were. Really? Yes. Three thousand of these were not delivered out into the retail world, though, were they? Yes. Really? Yes. Huh. You could go to any place that was selling a lot of Atari and find one. 
and it didn't last long. I mean, it, this, the technology was out of date by by a few months after Christmas, probably. And nobody wanted to pay for those uh, laser disc thingies that you had to have if you're going to look at a laser disc on an Atari, because the laser disc player and the laser disc themselves were too expensive. And there wasn't enough media to make it worthwhile. So we had everybody at Atari had a big learning out of that. But you have to understand, we were the biggest employers in the valley at that time, bigger than Hewlett Packard. And um, it was quite a, a wild, wild west thing. I see. I never saw the fab line. I just kept seeing the guy who was running it and say, how many have you shipped? And eventually he started hanging out a lot. And I said, what's up? Oh, we shipped all of them. I said, how many? A little over 3,000 is his answer. And then I later, at Christmas time, I went to shopping malls and looked around and I found them. Okay. In the uh, game, a computer game section where they were selling Ataris and games and, you know, and educational software and all the peripherals and everything you can imagine that went with it. So I got a big eye-opening lesson out of that. That some I didn't do the programming. It was too simple. Someone else kind of hobbled it all together. And I was busy on my other projects. The, the, the Great America Sound Tunnel, tunnel came later. But... Uh, you know, so ask me more. Let's see. Uh, it's another interesting looking project called Playland Kiosk that you did drivers for and an application for. Tell me about that. Yeah. Okay. So after that experience of watching the the uh, point of sale kiosk uh, uh, become out of date and there being problems, we said, what can we do? to help promote the craft of building interactive video games using laser discs. And so Harry Jenkins and his crew of a very high-end design school, we had Buckminster Fuller's protege, last protege assistant on our team. Okay, and uh, so we had some really, really creative uh, people working in that department and we were supposed to research future designs so we concocted well J Harry et al concocted and kept asking me and the other technical people can we do it can we do it and we said well you're pushing the envelope but we can give it a try so we got funding to collaborate with CoinOp to make this into, because they were already doing some laser disc games, uh, kiosk things. I wouldn't know, really call them. They, you know, that, that was the year that uh, Clint Eastwood released a movie about fighter jets. All right. Fire, and, Firefox, I think. Yeah. And Atari had a Firefox game. And I was working in that lab when Clint Eastwood came through and and met everybody who had, uh, shall we say, uh, helped engineer the, the game. And apparently, every, it was all perfect timing because it seemed to have helped everything. And it certainly propelled the video game world into... Uh, intense video graphics in your face kind of thing um, and I was working in the lab where where all of the prototype coin op games were, were put together by people with 40 years of color television experience technicians who'd been at the very very first color TV stations and later, um, you know, and we're used to testing bleeding edge hardware for the TV stations and tuning it to get it to work. 
And so that's when I came in there and they said, hey, where did you learn how to look at schematics like that? And I told them my dad's hobby was fixing color TVs. And he did it in the den while one TV was on and he had several others he was trying to get to work. And their jaw hit. I said, it's just like this lab. You've got TV parts all over the place. And there's some high voltage stuff exposed here, but I know where it is and I know not to touch it or I know how to touch it without getting shocked. And they were just like willing to tell me anything at that point. I could hang out with them and they could answer any of my questions. It's like the history of TV and what did you do first and, and, and who was your employer and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it was like hanging out with my dad. Um, so uh, basically I had proven that an operating system kernel was essential and they built a hardware platform or they were they took a pretty state of the art hardware platform uh, based on the 6502 um, and we were going to use that because it, it basically was pushing the video envelope and had really good custom-made frame buffer technology. And so I basically built the entire prototype user interface for the game, but uh, that's when Tremiel came along. And, uh, the, the engineering manager who was supervising the work I was doing at CoinOp at some point asked me to print it out, a, a source code listing of everything, and he apparently had somebody who, I don't know, he never told me who it was, but somebody he knew got went and looked through the entire listing and told him, they said, it doesn't matter what you paid for this, you got your money's worth. Hmm. So that's how far I got it. But that's when I stopped kind of going to coin up to work on it. And... And... Atari was imploding at that point, so uh, I don't know whatever became of that source code or where that uh, engineering manager went next or any of those things, uh, but CoinOp's still around. They might have a copy of it all in their archives someplace. You never know. Yeah. Right. Huh. So it was the same source code as the kernel for the 400 and the 800, but then I wrote new device drivers, and I wrote the, uh, what's called a finite state automata that managed the user interface, and it was super slick. That's why they were impressed. It later showed up in Microsoft, and it showed up everywhere else. I, you know, you never know who, when people share so code, you never know where an idea first started. But I did not have an example, and I had to create that. So it was based on my understanding of, of event-driven finite state automata, where you have a current state and you have an event that changes your state to something else. And it was slick. It was incredibly efficient and very, very, very sparse code. So all the code I wrote, like the kernel itself, was under a thousand bytes, and the, you know, and the, the applications. Like when I did some, I did a point, I did a, uh, a kiosk system for a shopping mall at Design Research, and uh, I think over ninety percent of the code was just data about how the interaction would operate. And there was very, very little code in the kernel or um, the user interface uh, driving uh, mechanism because uh, th the idea was to focus on what it did and not how it did it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I repurposed it. Anytime they needed something, I just wrote the application and and. and Maybe a little bit of enhancing here and there, but after a while, it was like all that stuff had did it, and it just needed data. Like, what what am I displaying? 
And we had uh, graphic designers to do that, so I'd get all these files about this is what this page looks like, and it had all the display list stuff worked out already, and all the data for the display lists, and I just had to glue it together. I was doing it all in assembly language at that point. Awesome. Nice. So after, uh, so you did some, some 2600 ROM, you said you modified some 2600 game ROMs? Yeah, that's for... one of the very first things I did, and I did a little bit of that later. Yeah. Uh, design Research built these kiosk, uh, not kiosk, but CES panels where they, you could uh, push a, a button and that game would start and it would, you'd be able to play it for a few minutes and then it would reset to the menu so you could select a menu list of games and then it, it would let you play the game for a few minutes and some of the games were written so poorly that they didn't work unless I modified them and some of those games all they had was the source code that had been given to the librarian when the game was turned in. They no longer had machine-readable source code, they just had paper. Yikes. And so I had learned how to do that at the uh, other company where I learned 6502 because I, you know, already long before I learned how to patch uh, PDP-11 operating systems while they were resident in RAM and test them. Uh, so, and not screw it up so that you could, you know, test it again, make more changes. And so I would look at the code and figure out where it was broken and insert in the, you know, in those ROMs, there were often big dead spaces. So, I would insert some code in the dead space, jump to it, and jump back to where I came from. And I would patch it. You know, when you start patching like that, you have to copy all the code you write on top of to the dead space. So it took a little while, but not really that long. And it was under a tremendous time pressure because we want to show these games at CES and people are flying out in a couple days. So, ah, I pulled it off like I'd nice. always, do. and and everybody was like, "Stan really knows what he's doing," uh, and that was the one of the very first things I did. So, my, I got invited back. You know, I, instead of being told no, we don't have any more work for you, they kept me around. Uh, actually. Sherman Kennedy and I survived into the Jack Tamil area uh, time period and most of corporate R&D and design research had been fired, laid off as the Valley calls it. And uh, Alan Kay had seen the handwriting on the wall and left to play tennis in L.A. He wasn't available anymore. But of course, he was available, you know, under some time and materials contract that they wanted him. And he became very expensive, so you never saw him again. Um, and they hired uh, Ted Hoff to take over uh, as vice president of R&D and uh, maybe chief scientist too. Anyway, Ted Hoff's claim to fame is uh, the first microprocessor ever manufactured by Intel was his idea. And so he was considered the inventor of the microprocessor on a chip. And that was called the Intel 4000 series. And eventually it became, it settled into something called an Intel 4040, 
which was then increased to 8 bits from 4 bits to mm-hmm. the Intel 8080, all while he was still at Intel. Um, and But he was new to, uh, you know, corporate administrative stuff. And he kept Sherman and I around because Sherman was a hardware guy and I was a software guy. And I could, and Sherman and I knew uh, a lot about 12-bit processors and 16-bit processors and and, um, digital was developing the 32-bit VAX architecture called the VAX 11 because it also included all of the PDP-11 instruction set. So it was both 16 and 32-bit. And Sherman and I were were uh, all the last of that crew and Sherman stayed quite a bit longer than I did because at some point there was nothing, no projects and no funding for projects yeah. coming from Jack Tramiel, no, So He was not super interested in R&D. He just, uh, that was not his thing. Well, well he wasn't interested in it and he, wanted, he needed to make money right now and so he focused on that. And that's where the, the you know, the 5600 killed that. Anyway, it, it, there was still some of that chip technology they'd been developing at R&D that got put into the future products. And then slowly they grew back out of them. And, um, but not while I was there. You know, the thing that was really uh, iffy about the whole thing was whether my last invoices were going to get paid or not. <laughs> That was always the question with Jack. And were they? Yes. Wow, you got lucky. I did. Uh, he made a decision about who he was going to pay and whether he had the money or not. And it turned out that by selling off massive quantities of Atari assets, now that 5,000 plus people weren't working there, he was making payroll for a while. And, you know, and then sales started to pick up again. It grew, but it was there was a long dry period that I wasn't there for. Yeah, and it was interesting. The R and D building was like a ghost town, and you could wander around into all the cubicles and desks and everywhere, and there was so much stuff that people had just left behind. But everybody was everybody in Atari who could get into that building was salvaging whatever they wanted. So I could go in a room, and Sherman said, take whatever you want. This is just going to go to surplus inventory and sales. And Sherman picked up several very valuable assets that the people in the surplus disposal department had no idea what they were. And Sherman had gotten corporate R&D to train him on how to operate those very expensive pieces of machinery. Like any good technician, he could fix and, and operate anything that he got his hands on. And uh, But that was technology that required a certificate from the manufacturer or he voided the warranty. But he had those certificates, so he bought the stuff for 10 cents or less on the dollar. He bought it by the pound sometimes and took it to his warehouse in Emeryville and and then he started making a living because he had one that worked and you could rent it out for a lot of money if it came with a technician, which he was. So, yeah, uh, the McKay brothers and Sherman had learned how to harvest from corporate surplus when they were at digital. And the McKays have some really crazy stories to tell uh, Sherman tended to go visit them, but he tried to stay away from the, the shady deals that uh, Michael McKay would put together. It's some very famous ones inside his storytelling. Anyway, it's like, you know, I have no idea what happened to all the stuff at Design Research once I stopped uh, being allowed to go in the room. Sure. Rooms. Yeah. And... Uh, it was pretty much the same time I stopped going into 
where Ted Hoff's office was, which was much, much bigger. It, it was like, have you ever seen anybody who's been evicted from a warehouse and didn't have time to get everything out? That's kind of what it felt felt like. Yeah. Um, I'm running out of time here, but I would like to talk briefly about what you do today. I know you do some stuff with Exploratorium, and if you could summarize that for me. Be I haven't done I haven't done anything with the Exploratorium in a long time, but I did visit the Exploratorium on Sunday for, mm-hmm. at, in their new location for the first time, and I did get a tour of the place from the only surviving. Uh, uh, can we say high school student who started there as a volunteer who's now been there an employee for a very long time wow. his name is Ron Hipschman and uh, he and I went to San Francisco State together and we're about the same age and so we have um, a lot of mutual friends and it's a long long story of about two people and it, so we went over the dates, so I got the facts a lot clearer about the explorer turn, given what, we, what he said on Sunday. Um, in the late 80s, I was the faculty person appointed to supervise San Francisco State's connecting to the internet. And we've gotten grants from various places to pay for all of it. And the only person who had any experience at it who was on staff was actually a student enrolled in the broadcast uh, communications department, and but he would worked at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, he'd worked at uh, UC Berkeley uh, Unix Systems Group, he'd worked at, uh, he'd been a student at Caltech, and he worked in the JPL computer room. Okay, so he was there when the JPL campus got internet. So before he came to San Francisco State, so he'd been around, but he hadn't been the person responsible for doing it. And since he wasn't faculty, and he was only part-time staff, they needed someone to supervise his work and to be the faculty member who would take some of the blame if he things went really wrong and cost the university money which never happened because Eric was one of these Asperger meticulous people you either do it right or you do it really bad so someone has to redo it and he had that philosophy about his work so when he made campus connect to the internet it went flawlessly and in the soon thereafter, we heard through Eric's uh, grapevine that the Exploratorium needed help with their email. So he and I started going over there together on Saturdays, and we got their email. They had bought some proprietary internal email product, and but. S- Somebody gave them, somebody convinced a division of Sun Microsystems to give them a brand new Sun server. And we uh, got UUCP working uh, and it made that Sun server into an email gateway. And uh, <clears throat> so they had, and we tuned it up so they had flawless email from their computers to the inter- to the UUCP community which is which at that time was connected with the internet but we weren't connecting directly via the internet uh, the we're talking about how you really we keep telling uh, Ron Hitchman you really need to connect the exploratorium to the internet you really need to do that you really need to have exploratorium connect to the internet and then go, they, you know, and I said, come to campus, we'll show you. Uh, and I don't know if Ron came and ever saw what we could do. Oh, we could dial up with a modem and show him stuff. But that was text, not graphics. And he came to, we came one Saturday and he said, oh, 
we've been going over this grant proposal that we're filling out for, and there's a little checkbox that says, do you want $50,000 so you can connect to the Internet? Yes, please. Yes or, yes or no. We said, check it, check it, please check it. We'll help you get it going. <clears throat> and so the rest is history. They eventually got the grant, and they got um, they got a T1 to a local ISP, and uh, and we uh, helped them register the domain name of exploratorium.edu, which was the very first 13-letter domain name. Nice. Uh, because the, the limit at those days was 12 letters, but it was arbitrary. The, the server technology for DNS supports any lengths. It's just that by some convention, they were restricting it to 12 letters. And we got it working with uh, the knowledge of Eric, and uh, I watched Eric do it. So I would watched him do sfsu.edu, but he would mostly talk about it. And then I watched him do exploratorium.edu. And this was... You couldn't run the, the only web browser that existed in 1991 unless you had a next workstation, which the computer science department had been getting since they were available. So we had web, we had the CERN server running on a couple machines in San Francisco State by that point in time, and uh, Ron Hishman has done some research. And he's pretty sure the Exploratorium was one of the first 600 websites in the world. Wow. But San Francisco State was even earlier. Okay, and we had a website in the computer science department and in the university a data center. One for the computer science department web and the other one for the university website. Uh, before the Exploratorium uh, was on the, was was a website, and everybody had to use CERN. But by the time we got the Exploratorium going, the, it was had been ported and ran on Sun servers too. And okay, so by the end of the nineties, the Exploratorium started winning Webby awards. And I believe that while I was advising them, they won six Webby awards, and then. The Webby people got tired of giving them awards, and so they started giving them to other equally deserving things. But in, the, in those days, the Exploratorium had a glass window to the data center, and Ron Hipschman put all the Webbies in the window, so you, if you walked in, you walked by the window. It's pretty cl close to the entrance, and you'd see all the Webby awards. And nice. so I, eventually they got six. I, th I don't think they got them all while I was still really active there. But um, I, I worked for Craigslist, and we got Webby Awards while I was working at Craigslist, and I was one of the people editing the website um, technology that we were using at the time. And so, I, you know, I don't even put it in my LinkedIn profile that... Uh, you know, that I was at places that won Webby Awards while I was editing their HTML and, <laughs> and CGI, whatever. Yeah. But, um, nice. you know, it's like, I eventually, in, this helped me, uh, uh, this helped me get uh, requested that I apply for a Fulbright scholarship to Peru and so I got the Fulbright grant in 92, but the uh, terrorism had closed the country to non-essential personnel, so the U.S. Uh, cons US embassy wouldn't let me go to Peru. I didn't go to Peru until 1994 for the three, um, what is it, about uh, 10 weeks in the summertime. Uh, awesome. Wow. Yeah. Well, we've strayed far afield from Atari, so uh, uh, I think I'm going to have to wrap this up. 
Um, thank you so much. This was very informative. Yeah, if you've got, if you uh, want any clarification, just let me know. Great. Well, I appreciate your time, and uh, I'll let you know when this is published. Yeah, everybody's asking me. Please send me the link. Uh, I have a publicist um, business partner in Peru. So he said, well, I want to see this. I want I, I told him it's just a radio interview. And he said, I don't care. I mean, he, uh, the first time I got live radio interview was in Peru during that Fulbright. And af- I didn't even bother to ask how many people were listening until afterwards because I was so scared I was going to screw up. <laughs> it was in Spanish. Hmm. And apparently a million people were listening. So that's the wow. largest live audience I've ever... Uh, this, this audience is uh, slightly smaller. So. <laughs> n- no, it's infinite because all you have to do is get people to go to your website and look at it again. And so, you know... I guess six billion is the potential audience. Somewhere between its small size and that number is where I guarantee that somewhere between two hundred and six billion people will listen to this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm I'm hoping somebody who remembers me from those days listens to it and gets back in touch. Uh, I hope that too. That's happened many times. Uh, often I get emails saying, "Can you help me?" get a hold of so-and-so I heard their interview I worked with them or you know well yeah I'm, I'm easy sort of to find because of my LinkedIn profile but uh, that that's all very intentional because I don't I've always been easy to find since the beginning of search engines I learned how to get people to find me and people go I, people tell me about all this SEO spam they're getting and I say I invented SEO in the days before anybody thought of doing that. You know, but that's a long time ago. Yeah. You said you forgot to tell me a story. I, I, I have this effect on people. They talk to me, and then after the conversation... Well, I, I hadn't even written it down in that outline I made, so I forgot about it. While <laughs> I, I loosen neurons, and they tell me things. So you said you had a story about the first touch panel prototypes for the Atari 400-800. Well, yeah. Actually, it turned into a product. Um, um, I went to, I, as I still like to do, I went to a trade show and, uh, there was a guy with this tiny one 10 foot square booth off in a, an obscure section where, you know, where startups tend to sh- show up mm-hmm. and he had touch panels and, uh, he had only like one simple model and, um, we talked for a while, and, and, and he found out that I was a consultant at design research at Atari, and that we were very interested in I/O devices. Um, and so uh, he invited me to his um, almost garage. I mean, it was like the size of three garages or something mm-hmm. that he rented. Do you do you remember uh, this guy's name? In, no. Okay. I'm not remembering, but I, I think if we researched the history of touch panels, we'd find it. He'd been working in this garage, he said, for a couple of years and had was kind of, he said he was out of money and really needed a sale to continue what he was doing. But he showed me a touch panel on an Atari 400 in his shop, Mm -hmm. which he hadn't taken to the trade show. And so I said, okay, it's working. It's cool. It just needs to go to mass production. And he said all that kind of, he knew what to do. He had it all figured out in his head, but he only had in his shop were essentially prototypes on various monitors that were available at the time. And um, so I told the person I worked for, Sherman Kennedy, what I'd seen and he was very excited uh, because his he'd spent much of his career in the last, let's say, five years working with prototypes, so he understood and uh, and hacking on them. So uh, <clears throat> he went. He, he said he'd go over there and take a look. That was 
I didn't hear anything for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say several months. And then, and then Sherman came and said, look what Atari's making. And he brought me this product off apparently some early production runs. And that's it. I mean, it hmm. turned into a product. I was this time for Christmas? Was this like the, the the touch tablet? So you were like drawing on a pad. Yeah, I think it was a touch. Hmm. Um, it was a touch tablet, but you could. He also had uh, the ability to make monitors with it on the screen. Hmm. So in other words, you could use it anywhere. It was, you could stretch it over a screen and make it interactive there. So the game division was interested. I don't know. It, all I know is they started having products based on this guy's technology. Huh, cool. And I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved other than telling them about it, <laughs> noticing it at a trade show and telling them about it. Cool. So nice. that's it. That's, All right. That's, and whatever touch-sensitive products they brought out for the 400, 800 were basically based on that. And I... I have no experience with how it got turned into a production model that Atari manufactured. Um, in part of my talking with you, I've discovered how connected um, my the person signing my invoices was with the, the historic Atari. Um, Larry Jenkins was the guy running design research, and uh, after we talked, I looked online, and it turns out he has had patents at Atari, um, but he never, he was very modest and just said he was a, a mechanical engineer or designer type person. Mm -hmm. He never really talked a lot about his mechanical engineering background, he more or less considered himself a designer. And uh, and that's why he got design research. But um, historically, in Atari, he was very involved in ideas that went into the chips that made the 2600 and the 400, 800 successful. Because in the early days of Atari, everybody worked in the same building, all the development people. Sure. It wasn't until... It wasn't until they actually it was the expansion to other buildings occurred while I was being hired. When I when I first went for interviews, I was crowded in some uh, warehouse area that they'd been given a corner of, and it wasn't even set up as a permanent office. It was just set up like, well, we're here while they're while our um, the building that they've gotten for us is is built out. And uh, so I have no idea what I was moving into, mm -hmm. but I was showing up and meeting with them at this place. So they were in the stages of spreading out when I arrived. And <clears throat> I didn't understand organizational dynamics enough at the time to, to try to figure out what had happened. They just said, oh, uh, Harry was a, uh, was uh, the uh, primary designer working for Bushnell. And as part of his uh, preparing to leave, he was giving Harry his own department uh, called Design Research. And that's it. I didn't like uh, get to know any of the people that he Harry had been circulating with. He didn't take me around and introduce me to people that he knew that it were at that by that point in time we were spread out all over the valley. I mean, sure. Um, the <clears throat> the Atari um, home computing division was in San Jose. So if you wanted to go to talk to anybody in home computing, you had to go to San Jose. And it wasn't like walking across the street or, or down the hall or anything like that anymore. And what I know now about organizational dynamics that pretty much explains why the whole um, organization kind of imploded after the, the wave of products that were developed before they split up. Mm -hmm. 
got to their end of their life cycle, which, you know, some of them, it wasn't fast. It, was, it, it, it Some of them petered out for a long time, but the 2,600 and even the 400, 800 was a map. There were so many of them made that software and gadgets for it kept being sold uh, long after the, the implosion. But the, it, it's basically because organizations depend so much on spontaneous communication that if you don't have a structure to compensate for that, when you just distribute them across a county like they did, you know, it, the communication, the creative interaction breaks down. And so some other compl- complexities entered in that uh, Warner's mindset was all, was too big. They didn't understand uh, garage shop prototyping sure. yeah. mentality. So if you didn't have a million dollar budget, they were interested in it. In other words, the managers that got put in place didn't want didn't want things to fail because they didn't give it enough money. And that's the wrong way to do things when it comes to engineering development of the type uh, that involves hardware and software and creativity is basically you give it just enough until it proves itself and then you can, can accelerate it. You just have to be ready to accelerate it at that point. And <clears throat> lots of companies do that now. I mean, that's essentially um, Apple's learned to do that. Lots of other companies, I mean, Google with their hardware and technologies, you know, cell phone technologies, they're doing it that way. Um, even Intel, to some degree, their uh, new CPUs, and they always come out with a, 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 a main board reference model, and all their licensees get all the schematics, and they can then evolve it from there. So they're not stuck figuring out how do I get these chips to work together. Um, but uh, in those days, people didn't know, and in the particular, Warner was was a media company that had never managed the technology development, and, and uh, the person they sent out was a marketing guy because Atari had products that needed to get out into the market fast. And but there, there were, the, that person then didn't have anybody under them that understood how everything fit together and wasn't encouraging more of that because we were all spread out now in different buildings. Sure. Yeah. Chip design, chip design was done in in the ground floor of what was called uh, research and development. And the top floor had uh, Alan Kay and his, his, the people he hired. So, um, even though technically Alan Kay was in charge of the down, of the, down the first floor too, um, it 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 just kind of we got all. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't going to the chip designers and learning how to program the new chips, and so there was no software ready to demo. You know, no significantly interesting software ready to demo when the chips were ready. So they were struggling. That I didn't know this until much later. They were the chips they designed went into the computers that were that Tremiel put out. But they were they they took a long time to get the software working. And so there was this disconnect between software development and hardware development that I wasn't even really aware of. I just knew that the the people who were doing the chip design had a kind of, uh, instead of being, oh, you work in the building, let me tell you everything I'm doing. It was like, you don't work in the building, so I'm not allowed to tell you everything I'm doing. Mm. So it was weird. But I'm seeing that only now. It's like, you know, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's the highly creative environments that I've had the opportunity to participate in. They always had really strong collaboration, encouragement uh, activities going on, and just splitting us up physically, <clears throat> splitting Atari up physically, 
and then creating policies like, well, you don't work in the building, so I can't tell you what I'm doing kind of policies um, really uh, interfered with the creative interconnect. Sure. Yeah, I get that. That's all. All right. Cool. Thank you, Stan. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. You're welcome. Bye. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute, there are two ways you can help. You can help fund these interviews directly by contributing to my Patreon. A small monthly contribution will help offset the expenses of making these oral history interviews. Contribute at patreon.com slash savits. Or make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thanks.